team were ready. Yes. Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, I can't believe that I'm saying this, but this is the last day of COP. Uh, we survived. We're here. And uh, this session is about one of our uh, proudest outcomes for this year. Uh, we started the year with a big experiential goal of 4 billion people as uh, actions from the partners that would, have, would be joining the campaign because we, at that point we didn't know. In January when we launched the campaign, we said this campaign has an experiential goal of mobilizing action from non-state actors to help build the resilience of 4 billion people from most vulnerable groups and communities to climate challenges. And, um, and the idea at that beginning in January was to uh, figure out a way in which we could bring partners to the table and create uh, an effort, a community effort, to, uh, to figure out how we can develop a set of metrics, a set of narrative, uh, pathways that could show to, um, to the world that as a community we are able to measure the impact of our, of our actions. Every partner that had joined since the campaign uh, has their own efforts to measure their impact. And what we're trying to do with, the, with this campaign and with the metrics framework that we developed and launched this year is to create a common platform for having that discussion. So today, we're going to hear in a lot of detail how that metrics framework has developed, what it's trying to do. And we hear also from some of our partners in terms of their thinking. Um, I will remiss if I don't mention that Throughout the process, we've had uh, the uh, participation of several partners on inputting into the framework that we have developed. We have had um, uh, uh, support uh, uh, by McKinsey, deep support by McKinsey. They helped us all throughout the process of creating the framework. Uh, and also, we uh, created and brought together a set of friends uh, to, uh, for a methodological advisory group, the MAC, and, uh, and this, uh, some of those will be today here with us. And has been an excellent effort to listen to the community that is working on metrics and measures uh, for adaptation. Finally, uh, wanted to uh, highlight that as part of the evolution of the, of the framework, once we have started developing it, we brought on board, uh, had the pleasure and the luck of bringing on board CR2, the center for uh, climate and resilience, resilience research uh, at the University of Chile, and they have helped us refine the, me the methodological framework and uh, have what we have right now. So uh, with that, I'll pass, it to, I'll pass it to the lead of all that work throughout the year, amazing work uh, on Inibirazil. Thanks very much, Jorge. Um, so I'm going to give a, a brief presentation on the metrics framework. Um, about like how it was set up. So next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so I think you all know this already, but in case anyone doesn't know about the race to resilience, um, it's a campaign launched by the High Level Climate Champions, um, and the aim is to drive action by non-state actors to deliver a step change in global ambition for climate resilience, um, and it's putting people and nature first. And it's a sibling to the Race to Zero campaign. Next slide, please. Um, so what we've done here, as Jorge mentioned, is we've put together a, a framework to track climate resilience. Um, and the campaign launched on Monday, um, a, the Climate Resilience Metrics Framework. Um, and it, it, it allows those non-state actors that are the focus of the campaign to measure the impact of their actions to build the resilience um, of vulnerable groups and communities. So using the metrics framework, um, our uh, race resilience partners are delivering resilience actions which will increase uh, the resilience of 2.3 billion people uh, and over 100 natural systems including mangroves, forests, um, uh, and others to resilience to climate change. And uh, the new framework, as Jorge mentioned, um, it was produced by the campaign with support from McKinsey um, and from the Centre for Climate Resilient Research at the University of Chile. 
Um, and it's the first time that non-state actors have this universal tool uh, to transparently measure and verify climate resilience outcomes. So next slide, please. Um, so the framework allows actions to be tracked against where there's the greatest need for resilience against specific hazards. Um, and we worked with McKinsey to produce analysis um, on, the, on this exposure. Um, and it demonstrated that even in a 1.5 degree scenario, up to 4 billion people will be exposed to increased climate hazards by 2030. Um, to, and these are the, the kind of the key, the four key um, hazards that were looked into. So next slide, please. So there were some challenges in putting together um, this, um, uh, this framework uh, that you know, I'm sure a lot of you will no doubt be aware of. Um, and the fact that resilience is quite complex, it's multifaceted, um, and it covers a range of hazard types and socioeconomic circumstances. Um, there's no real consensus on definitions of resilience or a lot of other key concepts, um, such as adaptation, with lots of different versions being used by different actors. Um, and then neither is there a universally agreed measurement approach um, for attributing um, resilience to, or increased resilience to a particular project or program. Um, there are also a lot of barriers for non-specialist actors, um, particularly in the private sector, for effectively measuring um, resilience and adaptation. Uh, next slide, please. And these were all things that we were aware of when we were putting together the framework. The metrics framework is really quite critical for the success of the campaign. Um, and we have several aims for it. And we want to enable ambitious campaign goals from our partners and mobilize action. Uh, we want to be able to record and track pledges and results. Um, and we want to identify gaps that should be filled by new initiatives or by existing initiatives with new projects. Um, and finally, we, we need to ensure, and we really want the metrics framework to help us to do this, that the, the data is reliable and that the campaign is credible. Um, and beyond this, we think that there is a space that this framework could fill by becoming a widely adopted measurement framework um, that supports engagement by businesses, investors, and, and other key actors as well. Um, next slide, please. I just want to mention a few things that the framework doesn't do. It's not a panacea, it doesn't do everything. Um, it doesn't provide an exhaustive list of climate resilience metrics underneath each high-level outcome. Um, it doesn't aggregate the depth of resilience across initiatives. Um, so for example, how much more resilient would an individual be? Um, or, you know, it, it's just they are, uh, they have increased resilience. Um, and it, it does not act as a policing mechanism or a central authority on resilience reporting. And for that last point, um, you know, it, it's not a central authority and we want to make sure that the Race to Resilience campaign works with those that have a greater expertise uh, to make sure that uh, the metrics framework is robust and is um, scientifically accurate. Um, so next slide, please. So the campaign uses gaps between um, need, pledges and validated outcomes to assess um, the resilience gap. Um, so the need here comes from that global analysis that I mentioned earlier. So this identified populations exposed to four key hazards. Um, and this was heat stress, both acute and chronic, agricultural drought, urban water stress, and flooding, both riverine and coastal. So the analysis assessed um, both slow and rapid onset climate hazards integrated with um, socioeconomic data. Um, and uh, it was on a five by five kilometer level. And that was to, in order to, to quantify um, the exposure of populations of varying vulnerability um, to you know, one or more of these climate hazards that I've mentioned. Um, so the, uh, McKinsey and uh, the campaign have made this um, available separately. 
Um, but I've included it here just to show that we want to use it as a reference point for the campaign to understand what gaps there are by initiative type um, or by geography or focus hazard. It's not the driver for the campaign, but it's just a reference point. Um, so we also intend to engage with um, partner initiatives to identify what are the drivers of the gaps um, and ultimately to work with them to close these gaps um, through you know, setting up new projects or new initiatives or whatever it is. Um, and in addition, we're also planning to work with the transformation partners in order to drive systems change that is needed. Uh, so next slide, please. So the framework captures initiative results through input, outcome, and pledge metrics. Um, so an input is a resource used by an initiative to undertake climate resilience activities, um, such as an active project. Um, an outcome is the product, goods, or services generated by initiative activities. And these are driven by pledges uh, made by initiatives uh, to increase climate resilience um, due to the provision of those outcomes. Um, and uh, we want to make clear that uh, increased resilience is initiative and context specific. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll come back to this, but the campaign is not saying this is what resilience means. It is different in for every initiative. It's different for every context. So next slide, please. Um, so these are the metrics that we've developed for the campaign. Um, and the, the key one here is resilient individuals. Um, remembering that our, our overall goal for the campaign is that by 2030, we want to catalyze action by non-state actors in order to increase the resilience of 4 billion people from groups and communities who are vulnerable to climate risks. So we're also measuring um, companies, countries and regions, cities and natural systems as well. So next slide, please. So this is a busy slide, um, but I just wanted to highlight that the, the pledge outcome and input metrics um, that I mentioned previously are here. Um, and they provide multiple reporting options for initiatives. Um, and initiatives will only report on the relevant metrics in the framework, the ones that are relevant to them, um, with all initiatives um, being asked to report against at least one outcome metric, uh, the ones that are in blue here. Um, so there are you know, additional metrics on the side that you can see kind of cross-cutting ones. Um, so these are finance mobilized, knowledge created and adopted, and resilience attributes, as these were all seen as key enablers for resilience. Um, and when we were putting together the framework, um, you know, talking to lots of people, they told us these are all things that you really need to be thinking about and that should be included. Um, and you'll hear more later about um, resilience attributes um, from my colleague, Daniela. Um, and the campaign will publicly report metrics um, on an aggregated level uh, through uh, a high-level dashboard. Okay, so next slide, please. So as I mentioned, you know, we're aware that resilience is initiative-specific and it's context-specific. Um, and for that reason, Race to Resilience campaign is not saying this is how you should define it. Um, but for kind of aggregation um, purposes um, and to be in a position to collect meaningful insights, um, we're asking initiatives to assign their outcome-related actions into either the nine Marrakesh Partnership Climate Actions um, or uh, the 10 IPCC AR5 Actions typology. So I won't go into detail um, of these here now, but uh, just to say that the, um, the 10 IPCC actions are in categories of structural or physical, social, or institutional. And then the Marrakesh Partnership Climate Actions, um, they encompass groups such as um, climate risk and vulnerability assessments, early warning systems, 
uh, climate proofing infrastructure. And both groups of um, categories are really quite broad. Um, and we wanted to include them both in order to align with both the scientific community and also the um, non-state actor community as well. So next slide, please. Um, so our metrics have enabled, um, you know, the framework has enabled gathering of, of data about what partners have pledged to do uh, by 2030. Um, so this is what this shows here. These are the pledges that our partners have made um, uh, this year. Um, and this includes um, building the resilience of 2.3 billion people, restoring uh, 46 million hectares of land, um, through working in 127 countries, um, and uh, through raising uh, $3 billion um, of financing. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, I've said a lot about numbers today, but uh, you know, above all, we need to remember that numbers are not the final word. Um, these are, this is about people, and it's about their stories, and their stories matter. Um, and I just wanted to mention that frontline communities are not sitting around waiting for us to be counting. Um, they're already taking action, um, and you know, they, need our, they need our support. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over uh, now to Paulina, um, who's going to tell us a bit more about the Race Resilience uh, Campaign's uh, governance and um, to explain how that, that all works. Thanks very much. So good morning. <laughs> I have a presentation. There we are. So what I'm going to talk just very shortly, very briefly, no more than five minutes about, uh, more or less, is about the governance of Race to Resilience. And this great team that is behind Race to Resilience uh, is a big team of people, very, very active, very proactive, uh, and a very nice group to work with. We are this year too are very happy to be part of the Race to Resilience family. And for the partner initiatives that are here today, and people from the MAC and, and the expert review group, thanks for being here today with us. OK, so I'm going to explain how we work, how this big group works. Uh, so if I can have the next slide, please. OK, you already know. I don't have to present them, but it, just in case. <laughs> this is Gonzalo and Nigel. They are our high-level champions, climate champions. Next, please. So here is who, who we are. Uh, so Nigel and Gonzalo, uh, they are the leader of this group. Then we have Ramiro Fernandez, that is the project sponsor. Then we have the Race to Resilient Colit, uh, sorry, Colit, that is uh, Jorge and David. And then we have all this group of people here. So uh, related to the metrics is Onia, that already just talked. Then we have the Race to Resilient Initiatives engagement, engagement. There are these four people here, and Nora is, is, is with us. Then we have the people that is in charge to engage with business, um, Bridget Peter Payal. Then we have the, the people that is in charge with the, with the case development and transformation, uh, which is Jorge and Nidi. Nidi is not with, with here with us today, I mean with us in the COP, so we miss her very much. So if you are there, Niri, <laughs> you, are, you are anyway with us. Then we have uh, the Race Resilient Partnerships and Event in church, so it's David and Anastasia, and then we have the communication team, that is Tio Azul. And so about, that is, that is the Race to Resilience team, but we have three advisory uh, bodies which is the MAC, that I'm going to explain in a second, the Expert Review Group, and the Race to Resilience Secretariat, that is the CR2. Next, please. So let's, let's uh, start with CR2, which is the, oh, sorry, <laughs> the CR2 is the Center, <coughs> uh, Center for Climate and Resilient Research from the University of Chile, in Santiago of, uh, of Chile. 
Sorry. Next, please. Oh, sorry. When I <laughs> when I organized my my PowerPoint, it, they were, you know, bigger. But okay, so I can talk if you don't see very good. So, the <coughs> technical secretary of the CR2 is academic body that provide technical support to the high level champions. Okay, so acting as a secretary to the expert review group and the MAC, the methodological uh, advisory group. So he's in charge now uh, of the metrics and uh, his improvement and development. Uh, he's also in charge of collecting uh, collating and interpreted the inputs of the Race to Resilience uh, partner. Sorry. <coughs> um, partner initiatives. Sorry, I'm gonna. Thank you. I have. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so the Center for Climate and Resilient Research is an interdisciplinary uh, research of Center of Excellence in Chile. And uh, uh, the research of the Center for Climate and Resilient Research is about climate change and how to reach the goal of achieving. So we work in mitigation, adaptation, and we work also this under the umbrella of the uh, sustainable development we work also with the sustainable development goals. So that is the technical secretariat, next one. And we are in charge, how I said, for uh, our relation with the expert review group and the technological uh, uh, group, advisory group. Uh, so these are the, the people that is behind the CR2. Uh, we have two brilliant uh, women. So we have Roxana Borges, that is the resilient officer. And we have Daniela Benavente, another brilliant woman that is uh, in charge of the metrics, and I work with them too. The next one, please. So our expert review group. <coughs> um, next one. So, oh, here works. <laughs> so except the review group is the advisory body, is composed by 17 experts from different geographies, background and expertise and this was very important because we receive initiative from all around the world and different sectors so we really uh, when we select this 17 expert we really care that we have to have that diversity so uh, we can have you know balance to evaluate the different initiatives so they were selected through our open call uh, where it was very competitive pool of, of uh, people that apply. And this is very important that w we selected to uh, um, an Opal Cal because this gives transparency for receiving the metrics because the expert review group is, is the one <coughs> that evaluates the metrics. So this is a very important point. We really want to, to ensure that our process in, in the race to resilience are transparent. Uh, they are members from the academia, some national government, private sector, civil society, from different dif uh, 12 different countries. 53% uh, are women. Uh, and the group of, wh what the expert review groups uh, group um, do in, in the Race to Resilient campaign? Uh, they um, uh, provide advice in which initiatives, which initiatives, sorry, should be included in the campaign. So when we receive the initiative, the, the initiatives, sorry, I'm thinking in Spanish now, the initiatives, they receive, we receive the initiatives and the expert review group uh, is the one, the group that evaluates the initiative uh, with a very uh, standard criteria that we have predefined. So uh, they can uh, work with that and see if the campaign uh, address all these criteria. And then also uh, advise uh, the progress of the race to resilience and make recommendations. So this is very good. So they are not there only for evaluating. They are uh, there for help, helping us to improve our, uh, our metrics and in general our campaign. Next one and the last one. 
Oh, no, no, it's not the Laux one. So here is the people that are from the expert review group. Now, next one. <laughs> I'm not going to mention everybody because we don't have time, but I really want to thank the expert review group. So then we have the methodological advisory group, the MAC, what we call the MAC. Next one. So the, method, the MAC, the methodological uh, advisory group, uh, is called by the International Institute for Environment and Development uh, and the University of Maryland. Okay. And it's composed of actors for uh, the Global Convention of Majors, the South-South-North, the Global Resilient Partnership, the Insure Resilient Global Partnership, and One Planet Business for Diversity, and the CDC Group. So these are, these are the organizations that uh, are in the methodological advisory group. Um, so, how I said, the Center for Resilient Research is the technical secretary of the MAC and also for the expert review groups. And we convene, we prepare and facilitate discussion with them. And uh, we also are always, we have meeting with them um, uh, frequently uh, to, and we present them our ideas for improving the metrics. Uh, so they give us uh, the really uh, expert view on, on this. Next one. So this is the last one. So the, here is the people that is uh, from our expert review group. And I'm not going to mention everyone, but I just really want to thank everybody from the expert review group and the MAC, the methodological advisory group uh, that, uh, that are key, key, really key uh, people involved in our campaign. So that is what I want to present today so you understand who is be behind uh, Race to Resilience and how we organize and how this organization uh, give us the opportunity to be transparent and to have robust uh, scientific contribution. That's it. Okay, so now uh, we're going to have a, a round table discussion. Uh, so I would like to invite our panelists. Uh, we need uh, more chairs, I think. Okay, so Aditi, sorry, some names for me are difficult. So Aditai Bahadur, please, if you can come here with here. Paul O'Hara. Oh, he's virtual. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. And uh, well, sorry. Aditai Bahadur is from the IIED. Then Paul O'Hara is virtual. Sorry about that. Then Carl uh, Schultz, that is uh, from the International Platform of Adaptation Metrics, that is also virtual. And um, Chen Has Nas Musa, that is from South South North, that is also virtual. So we are going to have a discussion. And uh, can we see them? Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay, okay. Sorry about that. Technology is not my best friend. <laughs> never has been. It's never going to be. I think. Okay, and we have Daniela also from the from the CR2. She's also connected. So, what we want to talk about today in our panel is how can a human-centered metrics framework make a difference to vulnerable people, communities, and, nat and natural system. So, we have prepared some questions to guide the discussion. And the first question is: What are the reflections on what happened? at COP related to resilience metrica, metrics. So you are here. <laughs> Let's start uh, with you. So 
if you can address, do you want me to repeat the question? No, no it's perfect. Very clear. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak today. It's a real privilege to co-lead the MAG uh, for the Race to Resilience. I'm really delighted to be part of this fantastic in initiative that has really been the talk of the town in Glasgow over the last two weeks. Um, also, congratulations to everyone for still being alive after two weeks of hectic events. Um, the Resilience Hub has really been our home over the last two weeks for everyone who's working on climate and development. So huge congratulations um, to Race to Resilience and Jorge and your team to, do, to be doing this. I think when it comes to metrics and what's happened at COP, I think there's a lot to say here, but there are two things that stand out to me. The first is the intensely hybrid nature of this COP as opposed to earlier COPs. And of course, most of the events that have happened at the Race to Resilience, uh, uh, the Race to Resilience events that have happened in the Resilience Hub have really demonstrated the importance of including voices that are usually not included in processes to understand uh, how resilient systems are becoming. Um, you know, in this COP, we've really heard from slum dwellers, from farmers suffering the impacts of climate change because technology has made that possible. So I think one of the challenges for the MAG going forward is to ensure that whatever results are being reported are being reported in a way that reflects the um, lived experience of people whose resilience we're supposed to be building as opposed to only the experts um, who are collating that data. So that's one thing that's been clear from the COP. The second is a challenge for all of us at the MAG, and that is the reascendance of the um, loss and damage agenda. And I think we need to figure out a way that our metrics speak to that agenda in a much more tangible way than they do at the moment. For instance, can we try and determine from our metrics the degree to which our, uh, the R2R initiatives are ameliorating the need for loss and damage payments? Can we also, can our metrics also shed light on um, when loss and damage occurs and rebuilding processes start? What can be done to ensure that we are bouncing back better as opposed to bouncing back to the same place to be as vulnerable again? Um, so yeah, I, I'll stop there because I know we have three other uh, excellent members of the MAG and look forward to your other questions. Yeah, very important points. The point, especially the point that you said that it's very important to don't bounce back to the same, uh, you know, the same state we were before. So let's take that opportunity. And that is what resilient about, to bounce back in a better, better state. So maybe the same question for Paul. Paul, are you there? I am. Hi. Hello, Paulina. Oh, hi. Hello. Nice Hello. to Hello. see Hello. you. Nice to see you. Hi. And uh, thank. just want to echo uh, the, the, the earlier sentiments. Thank you very much for inviting me along uh, to, to talk today. I was very pleased to be up in Glasgow on Monday and Tuesday of this week. And um, I uh, spent a lot of time at the Resilience Hub. And I just want to express my thanks to everybody um, involved in, in, in the work and pushing forward the, the Resilience Agenda because it it I think this COP has been very useful in bringing greater clarity and greater coherence to that to that entire agenda. So I'm a lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University. I'm on the uh, review, the, the expert review group uh, of the Race to Resilience, but I'm also working for the Manchester Climate Change Agency, developing climate uh, policy for the city of Manchester in the northwest of, of, of England. And for better or for worse, my uh, job title there is Adaptation and Resilience Lead. So I really find this COP very beneficial in helping clarify my own thinking around uh, resilience. When I was literally on the train from Manchester to, to Glasgow, I was looking at the our new chapter for our uh, climate policy that will specifically for the first time begin to, to, to think and begin to uh, progress the agenda in the city around adaptation and resilience. And one of the COP was very useful from, from, from that perspective, because I think uh, all of the work that's going on around adaptation and resilience has pushed the agenda on and has made my life um, as, a, as, as a policymaker that little bit easier because 
we can now look at the importance of adaptation um, and resilience and begin to identify not just how hopefully it is beginning to get parity with mitigation, but also how it can uh, reinforce and supplement uh, mitigation agendas, as well as other um, agendas as well. And, and perhaps I, I can return a little bit later to talk a little bit more about the policies that we're, that we're trying to develop um, in, in Manchester and expand upon that. Um, that, that. There's a lot of people that have got a lot to say, so, so I was going to keep it uh, just as, as brief uh, as that, just for the moment. Thanks very much, uh, Paul. Um, maybe we will move to the next question. So, um, Carl, I don't know if you are there, Carl, but no, I know that you are there, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the next question is, what are the implications for the campaign or for the work? Well, thank you very much for having IPAM at this event and congratulations to all the progress of race to resilience. Um, uh, the International Platform on Adaptation Metrics um, is, is, is here to help try to convene um, all of those who have a, a stake and an interest in, in, in metrics in the resilience and adaptation space. And we encourage um, this collaboration, this this working together, and this trying to make sense of metrics in a in a manner that is sensitive to contexts, but also where possible um, we can be speaking this a common language. And so, just reflecting on what happened on, at at the COP and what it really means for race to resilience, what it means for uh, the IPAM. I think I should just start out by noting that I agree with everything said about what happened at the COP. I would like to note, though, that I think, um, broadly speaking, adaptation resilience has risen on the agenda. But for all too, all, for, for, for years, I think a lot of people said, well, it's an important thing to do. Um, OK, and then not enough of it happened. And now people are beginning to realize, well, how you do adaptation and resilience is important and what's what's entailed in that i mean it requires more money of course it requires more projects and focus on understanding really you know where and what to prioritize but then you really have to think about well metrics how central is this to all of these questions and it is and so i think that that's the positive thing that we're seeing right now we also see the african group is really pushing for adaptation to be on the agenda next year at the egyptian cop in terms of just looking at how adaptation fits with the global goals. I think that's very positive. And also, I think if you look at what the Race to Resilience is doing, if you look at what IPAM is doing, there is a concern right now, though, that although there's attention to metrics, there may be a fear I have that all this attention to metrics will mean everyone's going to start doing metrics and we could have a balkanized, incoherent mess now that's my fear. Now my hope is that if we encourage better attention to how we do this, what's the frameworks under which do we, we, we undertake this, um, that the opposite could happen and we could have a more coherent and efficient and better understood sort of consideration for metrics, consensus where it's possible and understanding of all the stakeholders who need to be involved. And I think that some of the work, we just launched our adaptation metrics mapping evaluation framework, which is not a, not a balkanized competitor to your framework. It's a very different thing. It's trying to make sense of metrics across different contexts and aspects. But my hope is that we will see that with the interest of the race to resilience, that this interest in a care to how one does metrics, um, I'm a bit optimistic that we're actually going to be seeing uh, not a balkanized system, but rather more coherence. And that's necessary for adaptation. Thanks very much. Very interesting, all, all the point of view that, that you share with us. Um, so maybe I think that will be good to visit the same question. But now maybe uh, if you, uh, sorry. 
So let's be the same question. So if Chenas can 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 also give us our input to that question, uh, that the, the question is uh, what are the implications for the campaign or for the work? Thank you, thank you very much. And firstly, I'd like to congratulate the um, organizers of the Resilience Hub because they very nicely managed to have hybrid events bringing in the voices from the south and i'm sitting in the south in cape town south africa where it's nice and sunny as you can see outside my window which i think is quite different to glasgow but so for me i just like to take a step back i'm, I'm from the climate and development knowledge network so um and and to start from what we do know so climate resilience matrix are very much needed to align financial flows with the climate resilience goals of the Paris Agreement. And this calls for scaling on both the volume and the effectiveness of fin financial flows for climate resilience, particularly to the grassroots levels. I think what has come out from COP, and this is just from watching it virtually, is that this COP26 has firmly established that the climate emergency is a reality and that if we don't act urgently on it, climate and weather induced disasters will continue to rise and challenge the resilience of our systems, etc. The COP has also moved the needle on adaptation and resilience and I think this is very important. So there's also the commitment from global leaders to shift towards locally led adaptation. And I think this is a big win. And it's crucial for local governments and communities as they are the ones feeling the impact of climate change. I think there's also been quite a bit of progress in the negotiations on the global goal on adaptation. And in there, there's been the inclusion and also the um, enhancement of our understanding of the goal and from methodologies to the actual indicators and metrics. And I think this is a big shift because now we're moving into action. So compared with sessions of, of the past COPs, I've, I think that the issue of loss and damage has come up more strongly in Glasgow and I think it, it really has been a, a big push, particularly from the LDCs and I think from the Africa group of negotiators. And I think it's very much needed because we're seeing the devastating impact of extreme and slow onset events on people's lives and livelihoods. And I think this is where the whole resilience and the, the, the having the metrics for for, for it and matching it to the pleasure, pledges become very important. And before my last thing is that I think we've seen lots of pledges being made at COP and it's all hopeful. It has been outside of the formal negotiations, but my deepest hope is that these pledges actually materialize and that there's a shift and that finance flows to the majority world and that actions that address climate can start happening and happening rapidly. So with that, I'm handing back to you. <clears throat> okay, thanks very much, uh, Chenas. I just want to, to also uh, thank you for uh, recognize that, uh, that the race to resilience is, also, is focused also in the South, Global South, because we know that vulnerability is, is very high in the Global South. So, um, Aditya, do you want to comment in the same question? Well, should we repeat the question? Yes, please. Yes, of course. So, is, uh, what are the implications for the campaign or for the wor your work? Um, so, yes, I think there are two important uh, implications. Let me start with my own work. Uh, I think we who've been working on adaptation metrics uh, for a while now have not thought earnestly enough and deeply enough about loss and damage and how to bring that into uh, 
our thinking uh, on adaptation metrics, the degree to which adaptation helps reduce the need for um, uh, loss and damage is still a big question mark and a big area of inquiry that needs further investigation. And I think secondly, despite now three decades of clarity on how important it is to include voices um, from the front line of the battle against climate change in evaluation processes, uh, that continues to be a struggle. Either we have highly um, uh, like shallow processes of um, you know, participatory processes where five people will go into the field and ask um, people who are suffering the impacts of climate change for very limited input, or we just had, have very top-down expert-led processes. Co-creating an iterative process where people who are suffering the impacts of climate change can meaningfully contribute to longitudinal assessments of how their resilience is increasing over time, I think is still an area of um, action that needs further inquiry. And more recently, as an aside, I've been really thinking about that we uh, who work on adaptation metrics need to learn from other industries. For example, I think the customer care feedback uh, industry has a lot to teach us. You know, asking people, for sh asking people short, focused questions multiple times uh, to create a systemic understanding, I think is way important than expensive, onerous um, surveys that take, take place maybe three times in the course of an initiative or a project. Um, and at this COP, I came across a new term called blue marble evaluation, which probably is very familiar to some of you listening in, uh, but encapsulates this idea that uh, having you know, these very formalized process of evaluation two or three times in the course of an initiative is kind of 60s and 70s style thinking. We need to move to an approach where we're constantly evaluating the impact of our initiatives on the lives of people using information communication technology that has become ubiquitous uh, and uh, inexpensive. So uh, yeah, I think these are the two things. And I think I would argue that I think for the campaign as well, there is a need for us to have a position on loss and damage um, which is clear, coherent, and reflects the priorities of what was discussed um, at this COP. Uh, and I'm sure um, Jorge and Annie and others are already thinking about, um, uh, uh, about this. Uh, and yes, I think, um, uh, and continued emphasis on the race to resilience to ensure that it's not dominated by um, expert views or powerful, uh, or, or, or powerful interests and really reflects whether the initiatives that are part to re, uh, of the Race to Resilience are delivering the impact on the lives of vulnerable people. I think that has to stay uh, in focus and this COP has re-emphasized the importance of that. Yes, thanks very much for that. So it's very important that you, uh, you raise the, you know, the aspect of, of loss and damage. We were just talking yesterday about that how how we can include it we we have many ideas and that is one of 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 the one that we would like to focus so let's move to the next question uh, paul uh, how can the campaign learn from what happened at the cop and what should be changed for paul if you want to answer the question or give your your comments yeah, about sure. great yeah, thanks sure sure um I would just, just before I answer that direct question, I would just pick up on 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 the last point, all of which which I thought was was really interesting. In, in my work, I tend to get three key questions. The first is, what is resilience, and that's becoming easier to to answer because of the work of 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 the campaigns such as the Race to Resilience. The second is, how do we, what what actions might be taken at a city level or the municipal level. Uh, to, to pursue uh, resilience. And then the third one always tends to be, what about metrics? And I think after this COP, although there's still a lot, a lot of work to be done on, it, on this, I think what's, what's really interesting is that those three questions are becoming, for me, a, that little bit easier, uh, to, uh, little bit easier to, to, to answer. In, in terms of um, lessons ar ar around all of this, I, I still think, um, there, there's something about uh, local context, but which other speakers have, have talked about it uh, at, 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 at some length, which I'll, I'll not dwell too much on. But I, I think that that's, that's really important. I think one of the greatest challenges for the development of any policies around resilience is still around de developing a consensus around what resilience 
um, is and what resilience might mean for, for a city. And that's actually some work that I've conducted um, in, in Manchester to begin to think about how our resilience, our climate resilience strategies can also help facilitate and drive other strategies that are already already have co- got quite a bit of resonance at the at a municipal level. So we've come up with the idea of progressive resilience, which is about um, developing a vision for a climate resilient city that will see us enha- enhance the capacity of the entire city to adapt to future climate risks and stresses. But critically, we've started to do a lot of work around trying to latch that idea onto other citywide policies. So what we've uh, said about that is that uh, we want to align climate resilience with other progressive agendas around sustainability, including climate mitigation, inclusivity, and green economic growth, with the ultimate goal to produce a healthier, happy, and more socially just city. It's not perfect and it's very rhetorical, but I think what we're trying to do is to begin to pin down still what it might mean, what resilience will mean for our context, for our city, so that we can use other agendas to pursue climate resilience, but also use climate resilience agendas and policies to pursue those those, those other policies. So I think that, and, and um, I, I think um, the, the COP has been very useful in crystallizing some of our thought um, around that. I would also uh, suggest that there, there is, there's, there's quite a bit of academic work, and I know academic work can sometimes be, be a bit impenetrable, uh, and I say that as, a, as an academic. I struggle with, with some aspects of it just to get my head um, around it, but there is some very useful stuff in there that, that critiques the idea of resilience, but hopefully that does it in a constructive way. So I would, I think we, we perhaps need to do a little bit more work around uh, mapping out um, issues around maladaptation and also some of the more regressive dimensions of, of, of resilience. So for instance, a very brief example, and we'll, I will keep this brief, insurance. Um, I've, I've done quite a bit of work around um, insurance and insurance is very often held up to be a very important um, aspect of, of resilience. It's also reasonably easy to measure. People have got insurance or they don't have insurance. But what we need to make sure is that our metrics actually capture some of the complexity within that. So there are different types of insurance. Insurance um, will be uh, better or worse for people depending upon their, um, their, their individual circumstances. But also insurance isn't always adaptive. It can provide bounce back but not bounce forward so an insurer will come in and, and, and perhaps reinstate a property or a community to the condition it was in be- the, the day before the disaster without really embracing some of the, those more progressive adaptive uh, uh, betterment ideas uh, that, that we see in, uh, in in more radical or more transformative interpretations um, of, of the term so uh, I, I think um, collectively, perhaps there, there is a little bit more work that we can we can do around this. And I personally am very, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear if there's anybody in the audience or anybody joining us online, um, how your city or how your municipality has started uh, to to define and pin down what what it is that we might mean by by resilience. Okay, thanks very much. Paul. <laughs> so, um, Carl, do you like to, to comment in that question too? So, uh, about. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I'm very happy to. I, I think, I think the, the campaign. Well, it's interesting. You have, you have a top level metric, which Anya said, you know, it's, it's people made more resilient. And immediately I think, well, of course, what does that mean? I mean, <laughs> a little bit resilient, a lot, in what way? And as Paul mentioned, how do you define resilience is, is of course, critical to that. Um, I think it's, it's, not, it's not bad. In fact, it's very good to have aspirational metrics at that level because they tell a story and they show an ambition. But uh, I think 
the COP has shown that there's a growing intensity of discourse related to metrics, broadly speaking, and a lot of it comes from the South, which I think is good, very good, in that we need to be thinking about and what the African um, presidency, I, I believe, is going to be dealing with more is with the global stock take coming up, um, more and more people are just asking, well, what are we stock taking? You know, the Paris Agreement doesn't have any quantified goals for adaptation or resilience. It doesn't. It has some nice words, which I agree with. But again, operationalizing that is going to be critical if we're actually going to get real action rather than notional ideas or a balkanized set of things that don't don't have any coherence. So I, I would suggest that what the campaign can do is really focus on deploying the framework, which I think is really interesting and really promising across all of these different contexts so that we can get a little bit more concrete about what we're talking about. And when I talk about context, it's important really to consider the languages of the different people who sign on to goals, whether these are corporates or non-corporates, whether they're in the North or the South, but also to consider ways that you can make the different languages translate across so that if you're engaging with a corporate from the North and a community in the South, that still there's something that makes that billions made more resilient uh, specific enough so people can say, okay, we don't have to treat this as a, a, a just a, a nice, nice, nice word, but rather there's something behind it. And once we have that understanding, then there will be more confidence in the campaign. There will be more interest in stronger targets and we'll be able to go forward. To think about that context though, I think that there are five main aspects that really need to be focused on. And these are a part of the adaptation metrics mapping evaluation framework that I hope the um, your framework can really take on board when it's looking at translating these metrics from specific contexts into something more aggregated and but useful and concrete. And that's the purpose of the metrics is very important. The user competencies and capacities is gonna vary and you have to pay attention to those. And I think this, this question over, well, can we be getting more information quickly uh, and how the capacities of ICT have developed is, is, is useful in that respect, but still you can have different capacities. You have to be looking at how metrics are used for evaluation and good practice. And by good practice, that's that's a tough one too to think about. You do need to think about the data and the information environment in which these are applied. And then I think this is very critical. You need to really pay attention to how metrics are used and considered in engagement, in communication, and in participation strategies. And if you pay consideration to how metrics really relate against those different aspects, I think it will get closer to allowing for the language to translate across contexts and therefore for there to be more um, power behind what the metrics are saying that will lend confidence to the campaign that will only result, I hope, in more adaptation and resilience. Great, thanks very much for your valuable comments. Um, for us, uh, your comments and your suggestion are very, very important uh, because uh, how we said, we the race to resilience uh, is a, is a co-learning uh, process and co-production. So for us, it's very important to have your comments and your suggestions. So this session is helping us very much in that. We will take notes of all your comments and and for incorporating them in the in, in our development of the metrics. So thanks very much for, for that. And related to that is our last question that is very, very important for us to move forward. So what do we need 
to do after COP to ensure measurement is a useful tool and not a burden. So, uh, Chinas, if you want to, to give, your, to give uh, your comments and suggestions, that will be very helpful for us. Please. Yes. Um, th thank you. So I think I'm coming from a position that's not academic, that's not, it's more from a knowledge brokering position. And I think to make the metrics grounded, we do need to do quite a bit or a lot of capacity development around it needs to be done. I think you need to bring in the voices from what people have been calling the front line but voices from those who are most impacted. And what we need to be doing is via the programs, via organizations, is build agency of communities, of grassroots workers to feed into these processes that start using the metrics and the framework. And I think particularly for me, what is strong and I, and I want to reiterate it, is the capacity development around this and that it's done in a way that is empowering and that moves the process forward. So, yeah, back to you. Thanks very much. Thanks really, really very much for your, your suggestion. So, Adita, you would like to comment in that sure. too? Sure. I mean, I'm as always, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Musa about the importance of capacity building, but I think this is a very important question and goes really to the heart of making uh, measurement a success <laughs> uh, in the campaign. If people start feeling that this is an extractive exercise and they're constantly being asked for things and they don't see the point of it, it's going to fall apart very quickly. So I really feel what we need to do uh, very quickly is start collating, synthesizing what we're learning and feeding it back into the initiatives that are part of the Race to Resilience so that they can quickly uh, understand what progress is being made collectively, A, and B, the metrics framework needs to be the linchpin of the peer-to-peer -peer learning um, mechanism that I know is really woven into the ethos um, of the campaign as well. So I think when metrics start to serve the needs of learning, that's when we'll, uh, people will start to really understand um, uh, other point of it. I will add one more thing, and I think again that's a challenge for myself as co-lead of the uh, MAG, is to try and extract the implications of what we're learning from uh, the R2R initiatives for other salient agendas that we should be feeding into. Like what is our synthesis and insights on um, the metrics from R2R telling us about what the global goal and adaptation should look like? Right. Uh, what is it telling us about how to really measure or contribute to the debate on loss and damage? What are these other salient agendas? Very soon we're going to enter, before we know it, in the next five years or so, the next cycle of what's going to succeed the SDGs. I think the R2R is in a perfect position from its, uh, you know, stemming from its metrics framework to inform the development of what these new goals uh, should look like. So yeah, to encapsulate, it should serve learning and we need to demonstrate um, and contribute to other salient agendas that are unfolding around us. Okay, so we still have a, a room, a f more time for, for, oh, sorry, my. <laughs> so we are, we'll still have some time because we want the four of, to listen from the four of you about this last question because for us it's very important. So, um, Oh, I, I lost my track. Paul, right? Paul, if you want, if you you could help us in answering uh, this question. Hello, hi, hello. Um, yeah, I, I just want to echo uh, th those points as well. I think it's it's about identifying how resilience and climate resilience can be used as a vehicle to stimulate other progressive agendas around social equity, social justice across municipalities and, and, and beyond. I think that, that, that that's really, uh, really important. And I think that that's how climate resilience can get traction, particularly um, in, in, in cities such as those that, uh, such as the one that I, that I work in, where we haven't, we just haven't paid enough attention to understanding what our risk is, our climate risk is 
around uh, yes our infrastructural assets on our, on our buildings but also from our uh, community vulnerability as well so i think that that being able to tie together uh, these policies and, and using a metric system to be able to demonstrate that i think it would be would be very useful i came across whenever i was thinking about uh, this session i came across really a really nice uh, really nice quote from pearl zoo who said people do what you inspect not what you expect and I think we've got to be careful with metrics because there is a criticism, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a, a skepticism, verging sometimes on cynicism around metrics. And some of that is, is perhaps misplaced because metrics, I think, are very, very important. But there might be something in, in these critiques that we need to pay greater attention to. And I think if we, if we, if, if the metrics themselves become too burdensome, they, they will alienate people and, 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 and people in organizations might want to create a little bit of distance uh, uh, from it. At the same time, I do think that we need some sort of mechanism to measure progress and where necessary to potentially hold people's organizations, corporations feet to the, feet to the fire to make sure that they're doing the right things around, around resilience. I don't have very many of the answers for that. Um, so I'm, hopefully the, uh, the, the, the MAG group will, will, will begin to, to, to help us uh, with that. But, but this, this tension between having metrics that, that actually drive action and push us in the right direction against having metrics that, that, that perhaps become burdensome and, and then detract from our from from our collective mission. I think that that's a that's a big tension, um, and and I'm very much looking forward to to, to hopefully feeding feeding into uh, into that discussion into that debate because I think it's very sorely needed. Gray, thanks very much, Paul. Thanks, really. Uh, so, Carl, you, uh, if you want to make uh, your suggestion and and uh, in in around this question. Well, I don't know if it's a, exactly a suggestion. It's perhaps more a reflection that hopefully will be useful. And uh, that is that metrics in the context of action um, serve as, as a, a, a medium, if, if done well, for um, incentives. Um, incentives that, you know, if, if one knows, you know, how much money one has, <laughs> one knows if they need to go out and get some more money or, or, or what, you know? And, and if you look at, uh, in particular, in the finance space, and I mean this both from the perspective of development funding, but also from the perspective of private financial flows, there has been good attention to uh, metrics for certain um, positive sustainable outcomes, but less so perhaps because of the inherent challenges in adaptation for adaptation or resilience. Um, and part of that is that the, this definitional question that was raised over, you know, what is resilience? What is adaptation is, is a, is a, is a challenge. Uh, but back to the whole finance side of things you have right now, more and more resources going for um, impact investment than ever before. It's a hot subject. And equities are now saying, well, we have to, we have to really understand where, you know, where we're sustainable and, 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 and have metrics for not just our uh, greenhouse gas mitigation and our transitional risks in that regard, but we need to be thinking about this, this, this question over physical climate risks because they impact the underlying value of, of equities, of capital. And so I think we have an opportunity now to really address these questions over the insufficiency of finance going to adaptation, both in the North and the South. And there's potential for metrics and for the Race to Resilience campaign, considering everyone who's on board and who could be on board for paying attention to this, this question over incentives, 
paying attention to how metrics can enable more confidence in decisions about where money goes. And that by itself, I think, will be one of the biggest things that Race to Resilience can accomplish, of course, with many other parties, and considering the international frameworks like the global stock take, and considering the needs and the concerns of developing and vulnerable countries when doing this, and so that they're behind this effort uh, is going to be critical and hopefully will uh, help the Race to Resilience campaign to uh, be more effective. Thanks very much, uh, Carl. We cannot be more grateful for for having you on board, really. Uh, it's, it's, it's very important. And uh, we learn a lot about uh, from you. We learn a, a lot of, from you. So thanks very much for being part of the campaign. So now we are going to have Daniela, that, uh, that is our, oh, thanks very much. <laughs> So now we are going to have Daniela, which is our re metrics officer, and she's going to tell, tell us about uh, the future of the Race to Resilient Metrics Framework, and uh, it's a presentation outlining plans over the next year and up to 2030. So Daniela, Daniela Benavente from the CR2. Yes, thank you, Paulina. I'm uh, waiting for the presentation. So, I'm a metrics officer, I'm an economist and uh, econometrist, and um, an expert on, on, on metrics actually. So, I've been uh, collecting all the data from uh, our partners and um, from the survey we had with our partners as well. So, because we have two lines of data, we have the actual data on, on, on the actions they're taking, and we have survey data to characterize the campaign. So we'll see a few of those uh, results as well in this presentation. Next slide, please. So we'll see how we are going from pledges um, now into the future to validated outcomes with the goal of bridging resilience gaps and the focus on resilience building attributes. And I hope as well that I'll be uh, providing some answers to some of your questions actually. Next. So you're already familiar with this. We have the dashboard elements of the framework. Uh, in 2021, we have partial metrics on pledges and inputs in all the pink areas, so we're very proud. And the challenge for 2022 will be to deliver on the gray areas. And that concerns essentially outcomes, knowledge, resilience attributes, and on the part of the inputs on funding as well, because we have a few gaps there. So I will not go into all the details of what we achieved this year in terms of, you know, 2.3 billion people uh, uh, with increased resilience. And, and that's important, actually. We're not, we're not measuring resilience. We're measuring increased resilience. Um, and, but you can see here as well that we had uh, some pledges from five initiatives and companies, for example, covering 236 companies and growing, uh, nine initiatives uh, with uh, detailed listings of uh, countries. Um, and we even had two initiatives that were in a position to make pledges on the hectares of natural systems that are gonna be ma uh, made more resilient. So I will, next slide please. I will show you that we have three main reasons to be very optimistic. Uh, first, because with the survey, we realized that even though we have currently uh, initiatives uh, reporting on a few of these metrics, most of them have ongoing or future plans to report against other uh, scopes. For example, you know, three uh, and five um, initiatives with um, um, intentions to, to cover companies uh, that and not covering that um, currently. Next. The second reason is that the time frame for increased resilience goes well beyond that of the pledges. Paula Harry mentioned this issue of progressive resilience. Um, and and uh, this is important because um, for different reasons, um, either budgeting, planning, or whatever, we have a few initiatives that could not actually commit up to 2030, but still the actions they have 
may go well beyond. Uh, we see here that 50% of the actions have uh, an increased resilience, uh, medium term increased resilience uh, by 2030, and more than 35% uh, beyond 2050. Next. The third reason to be optimistic is that um, most of our initiatives uh, focus on climate resilience and do not just have climate resilience embedded in their actions. Uh, by that we mean maybe we have initiatives working uh, essentially on poverty alleviation, for example, and covering partially um, climate resilience. It turns out the, the initiatives we have essentially focus on climate resilience, which is great. And they also focus mostly on sustained resilience as opposed to active resilience. Uh, and we define active resilience as adaptation contingent upon an ongoing project, whereas sustained is something that goes well beyond the actual action. Next. So now we have to go to validated outcomes. Next slide. So the way we go about this in the metrics framework is that we want all actions to be aligned with the Marrakesh or aircraft climate action typologies that we use. Uh, that infers from that we infer an evidence base that actions uh, will build resilience in the recipient group. Then we want to know about outcomes from, uh, and that means the actions actually being developed and delivered, and then. Based on the alignment with the Marrakesh actions, we assume that they will have increased resilience, but then we have to validate these outcomes. And that's the, the third uh, element, which is to actually validate that there is resilience in the, in the, uh, the groups benefiting from the actions. Next slide. So what that implies uh, practically is, for example, not just having the evidence of the built infrastructure, here we have an example of the levy, but also maybe baseline and deadline surveys on uh, for the neighboring community um, in, in, in the particular in territory. So all initiatives will be expected to undertake steps one and two. Uh, initiatives already undertaking step three will be encouraged to incorporate these into their reporting. And initiatives not yet undertaking step three will be invited to provide a pathway to building this capability within a two year window. The campaign will support this pathway through a learning platform and matchmaking with other members to build capacity. Next. The second set challenge is that pledges and outcomes uh, primary metrics, which we already have, will require to be complemented with secondary metrics. And by that, we mean that we want to know not just that 100 million people are uh, having increased resilience in, say, Chile. We want to know exactly to what hazard, in what particular territory at the region admin one level, DT, or natural system level, or company, and uh, related to what type of action. So that is the challenge for uh, the validated outcomes. Uh, next year to, to really get to the point of these secondary metrics. We have a list of third level metrics as well, uh, but you know, let's <laughs> not be too ambitious. Next. So for that, we use metrics classifications that are very well known, international ones, uh, and that we will be using not just to validate the outcomes and to close the data gaps, but also also to uh, you know make sure that initiatives have available data that they can use from national sources as well to fill in information gaps they might have. So on hazards, we use an ad hoc um, classification that follows very closely the IPCC hazard classification. Uh, and McKinsey's risk analytics data that Anya talked about. In geography, we're going straight to UN local, the OECD and the UNOPNATS, for example. Um, cities as well. For ecosystems, we're using a well known international classification from IUCN on occupations with ILOs and on sectors, uh, I6UN uh, classifications. Next. So now the goal as well is to bridge resilience gaps. Next. So as you know, we follow very closely the IPCC conceptual framework of risk. And what the metrics framework does is that we link directly resilience 
which is the flip side of vulnerability, one of the pillars of uh, risk for the APC, to exposure to climate hazards. Why we do this? Because we actually use the same metrics, human counts and hectares of natural systems with increased resilience. Next slide. So, Anya already presented this, uh, but what we, our aim is to be able to compare convergence and progress across the world and make claims not just such as 1 million and 2 million individuals have been made more resilient in Bolivia and Peru, respectively, for example, but also to be able to say contrasting outcomes to pledges, the resilience progress is 80% in Bolivia and 20% in Peru. That, that's progress of the campaign. But as well, based on exposure data, we'd like to be able to claim that the contribution of non-state actors to resilience convergence is, say, 5% in Bolivia and 10% in Peru. So we have different levels, and uh, we are, with the framework, in a position to normalize the data with the exposure data that we have and uh, to um, have initiatives accountable for their pledges through their outcomes. Next. There is as well a focus on resilience building attributes. And I think that this will please most of you <laughs> because I saw from your comments that this, this is something that is very, very crucial. Next. So based, so the survey is actually very, very complete. We're linked to SDGs. We have lots, lots of data and actually we're working on a report that will be issued at the, um, at the end of uh, January, beginning of February, where we will present all this great data that we were able to, to collect this year uh, because it goes well beyond the dashboard. Um, but now going into one of these cross-cutting outcomes, uh, the resilience uh, attributes, we actually ask initiatives to send narratives on how they go about their actions. And uh, we, the, we developed as well a typology of seven uh, resilience attributes, which are qualities or characteristics essential to a resilience building. Those are preparedness and planning, learning, agency, social collaboration, equity and inclusivity, flexibility, diversity, and redundancy, and assets. The idea is to develop survey-based metrics around resilience building attributes by April 2022. We had already a seminar on this issue, and we piloted this. Next slide, please. This year, um, in one of these attributes, which is equity and inclusivity. So these are the results from the survey that we sent to our 25 initiatives. We got answers from 20 of them. And um, we concentrated on two, two types of um, vulnerable communities, those that are directly vulnerable to climate change, for example, communities to flooding or water stress basins, uh, small holder farming, and so on. And uh, the, we have a second level, of, same level, but you know, second type of, um, of uh, group, which are what we call the historically marginalized communities, such as women and girls, uh, youth, uh, refugees, indigenous communities, and so on. Uh, these are actually the different communities uh, and community levels where our um, partners are working. Uh, next. But the campaign seeks to avoid tokenism and to involve vulnerable and historically marginalized communities into the actions. So uh, we had a couple of questions on that as well. We wanted to know if uh, these communities are partners or co-leads in the project, if they are consulted prior to the project, during the project. And we got, as you can see, uh, great results. Um, I have a couple of statistics here. Well, and um, the other thing that we wanted to ask is uh, if the impact on these communities was intentional or incidental. And so about 80% of it is uh, usually incidental. So the idea is for each of the other uh, six attributes to develop questions like this. Uh, we would be very interested in getting any feedback you might have or any ideas uh, to further the, uh, characterize the campaign. Next slide. So 
So this is my last slide concluding remarks. So to conclude, we have very good reasons to be optimistic, but we also have important challenges ahead of us, particularly in validated outcomes and uh, resilience building attributes, but also in finance and the creation and adoption of knowledge. A crucial point to add is the collaboration, co-creation and co-learning with other metrics organization over the coming years. We already started this year with the Knowledge Resilience Coalition. We had a seminar, uh, as I mentioned, with CAMDA and IPAM. And we also want to further engage with the Global Climate Action Portal NASCA of UNFCCC because one of the main challenges uh, ahead of us next year, as of August, September, will be to have a platform uh, to collect the data from not just initiatives and pledges, but from all members belonging and part of these initiatives um, and their projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela. Well, we have challenge for for next year, <laughs> but we see this challenge as opportunity for improving our metrics. So, thank you, thank you very much, Daniela, for that great presentation. Very clear. Uh, so now we will have uh, Jorge, that is a co-lead of Race to Resilience, together with David. Uh, uh, so, uh, Jorge, if you could give us some final remarks, please, about the session. Thank you, Paulina, and uh, thanks for all who have participated in the in the panel with questions, with presentations. Thanks, Daniela, as well. Hope you're doing well in Santiago. Uh, just a you know a, a reflection is this is an evolving process. It's a journey that we're coming all together. The reason why uh, uh, with Gonzalo and Nayo, we thought and David and I that uh, we were creating this this metric framework was to allow for the community to come together. It's not about us uh, uh, having the truth in our hands or imposing that. Uh, every actor on, the, on resilience is doing great work and actually genuinely trying to me measure, track and measure the impacts that they're doing on people. What they wanted to do is to create a provocative uh, spiritual goal of four billion, not because we think that that's the only way to measure resilience or increase resilience, not because we want to put a number uh, and it's about how we tell the stories of those people that are becoming more resilient. So it's not four billion people, it's four billion stories of people. And uh, the fact that we can have a platform that allows for everybody to come feel comfortable and go into that journey of sharing how we're trying to measure and then telling the story of how we're making people more, uh, more resilient to climate change, that's all about this framework. So uh, whoever have uh, participated in this meeting and was, wasn't aware of the, of the race to resilience, uh, we invite you to go to the website. Uh, you just put in Google Race to Resilience, you'll find it there. And uh, there is a way in which you can learn how to join the campaign. Um, and uh, please, please do so if you're interested in this work and uh, in contributing as I'm sure many of us and others around the world that are not part of the campaign are already doing. So and thank you so much for today, uh, Paulina, Oni, for organizing this session. And uh, yeah, I think that that's it, that's a wrap. We have. We are only one minute past of the time, and and uh, thank you very much, Jorge. The, uh, one. Of, this is a growth learning process. We have been saying it, you know, once and once, <laughs> more and more again. So, one of the we have a student working with us at the after race to resilience, and one of them is out here as with us, and she asked for just one minute to to tell what means for her and for a student to be part of the resilience. So. Sorry, we, we take one more minute. Thank you, Paulina. Uh, hi, I am Romina Bisquet. I am a student, engineering student of Renewable Natural Resource of University of Chile. And I only want to say um, in this work, I understand uh, what means resilience. And, and um, I, I am so um, thankful for this work because um, the last year I didn't know what means resilience and now uh, I can say when we, uh, we can recognize, recognize the vulnerabilities and risk and hazard of different population groups, we can uh, work on them. So uh, when we talk about um, 
um, adaptation, transformation, and resilience, uh, we talk about um, environmental justice. So um, I think this is very important of our future. Um, I think the resilience is the center of, of, of our future. So I am so hopeful for this project, for this campaign, and that um, thank you so much. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody for coming here, and, and, and thanks for Romina for this is spontaneous uh, 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 coming and, and, and you know sharing for us what is for a student to be part of the campaign too. So we have, you know, leaders for the future like Romina <laughs> that are here with us with the resilient campaign. So thanks very much for everybody. Thanks for the the ones that connected from from your from your countries. Uh, so thank you very much and, and enjoy the last day of, of, uh, of COP if you still have some energy left. <laughs>